Live from Orlando, Florida, it's theCUBE. Covering Accelerate 19. Brought to you by Fortinet. Hey, welcome back to theCUBE. We are live at Fortinet Accelerate 19 in Orlando, Florida. I am Lisa Martin with Peter Burris, and Peter and I are pleased to welcome one of our alumni back to the program, Derek Mickey, the Chief of Security Insights for Fortinet. Derek, it's great to have you back on the program. It's, a, it's always a pleasure to be here. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's always good conversations. I really look forward to it, and it's, um, it's never a boring day in, in, in my office, so wow. I'm more than happy to talk about this. Fantastic, <laughs> yeah. excellent. Well, we've been here for a few hours talking with a lot of your leaders, partners as well. The keynote this morning was energetic. Yeah. Talked a lot about the, Ken talked a lot about the evolution of um, not just security and threat, but obviously of infrastructure and multi-cloud hybrid environment in which we live. You have been with FortiGuard Labs for a long time. Mm -hmm. Talk to us about the evolution that you've seen of the threat landscape and where we are today. Sure, yeah, so you know, yeah, I've been 15 years now uh, at FortiGuard, so if I flash back even to 2004, um, it was a vastly different landscape back then. And in ter and even in terms of our security technology, in terms of what the attack surface was like that back then, uh, you know, Ken, Ken today was talking about edge computing, right? Because that's what, you know, 70% of data is not going to be making it to the cloud in the future. A lot of processing is happening on the edge um, and threats are migrating that way as well, right? But there's always this mirror image that we see with the threat landscape. Again, threat landscape, <clears throat> back in 1989, we started with the Morris worm. It's very simple instructions. It, it took down about 80% of the internet at the time, but it was, it was very simple. It wasn't too, quote unquote, intelligent, right? Uh, of course, if we look through the 2000s, we had a lot of these big worms that hit the scene, like Conficker, I love you, uh, uh, Anna Kornikova, Blaster, Slammer, all these famous worms that uh, started to uh, become peer-to-peer, -peer, right? So they, they're able to actually uh, spread from network to network um, throughout organizations, take down critical services and so forth. Um, that was a big evolutionary piece at the time. Of course, we saw um, fake antivirus, ransomware come on stage, um, <clears throat> blastware, as I called it, which was destructive malware. That was a big shift that we saw, right? So actually physically wiping out data on, on systems. These are typically in like cyber warfare based attacks. And that takes us up to today, right? And, and what we're seeing today, of course, we're still seeing a lot of uh, ransom attacks, but we're starting to see a big shift in technology um, because of this edge computing use case. Um, so we're seeing now uh, things like swarm networks I've talked about before. So these are not only, uh, like we saw in the 2000s, threats that could uh, shift very quickly from network to network, um, talk to each other, right? Um, in terms of worms and, and, and so forth. But we're also seeing now uh, in intelligence baked in. And that's a key difference in technology because these threats are actually able, uh, just like machine to machine communication happens through APIs, protocols, and so forth, threats are able to do this as well. So they're able to understand their own local environment and how to adapt to that local environment and capitalize on that effort. And, and that's a very, very big shift in terms of technology that we're seeing now in the threat landscape. So a lot of those old threats were dependent upon the action of a human being. Right. So in many respects, the creativity was a combination of can you spoof somebody, make it interesting so that they'll do something, and there was always creativity in the actual threat itself. But what you're describing today is a world where it's almost like automated risk, yes. where just as we're trying to do automation to dramatically increase the speed of things, reduce the amount of manual intervention, the bad guys are doing the same thing with these swarms. They're introducing technology that is almost an automated attack yeah. and reconfigures itself based on whatever environment, conditions, and encounters. Yeah, and the interesting thing is, what's happening here is we are seeing a reduction in what I call a TTB, a time to breach. So if you look at the attack life cycle, uh, Everything does doesn't happen in, in the blink of an instant. It's moving towards that, right? But if you look at the- Oh good. <laughs> this is what's to come. I mean, we're, we're seeing a lot of indications of this already. So we work very closely with MITRE, uh, the MITRE attack framework. It, it describes different steps uh, for the attack lifecycle, right? You start with reconnaissance, weaponization, how do you penetrate a system, move in the system, collect data, monetize that as a cyber criminal. Um, so even things like reconnaissance and weaponization, so if you look at phishing campaigns, right? People trying to fish uh, people using social engineering, understanding data points about them, that's becoming automated. That used to have to be a human trying to understand their target, to try to fish them so they could get access to their network. There's toolkits now that will actually do that on their own by learning about data points. So it's, 
It's scary, yes, uh, but we are seeing indications of that. And, and look, the, the end game to this is that the attacks are happening much, much quicker. So you got to be on your game. You have to be that much quicker from the defensive point of view, of course, because otherwise, if, if a successful breach happens, you know, we're talking about some of these attacks, they could, they could um, be successful in a matter of seconds. Or, or minutes instead of days or hours like before, um, you know, we're talking about potentially millions of dollars of, of revenue loss. Um, you know, services are being taken offline, intellectual properties being breached and so forth. So. Oh, and this is, you know, you think of healthcare alone and literally life and death situations. Absolutely, yeah. How, and, is, how is Fortinet with your ecosystem of partners poised to help customers mitigate some of these impending risk and changing risk. Yeah, uh, coverage, strength in numbers, right? So we have a, a strong ecosystem, of course, through our Fabric Ready program. So that's a technology piece, right? End-to-end -end security, how we can integrate, uh, how we can do, use automation to you know, push security policies instead of having an administrator having to do that. Humans are slow a lot of the time, so you need machine-to-machine -machine speed. So our Fabric Ready program, you know, we have over 57 uh, partners there. It's a very strong ecosystem. Uh, from my side of the house on threat intelligence, uh, I, I had up our global threat alliances, right? So we are working with other security experts around the world. Cyber Threat Alliance is a good example. Uh, we've created intelligence sharing platforms so that we can share what we call indicators of compromise. So basically blueprints or uh, fingerprints, you can call them, of attacks as they're happening in real time. We can share that worldwide on a platform so that we can actually get a heads up from other security vendors of something that we might not see and we can integrate that into our security fabric in terms of adding new, new uh, you know, intelligence definitions security uh, packages and so forth. Um, and that's a very powerful thing. Beyond that, uh, I've also created other alliances with uh, law enforcement, so we're working with Interpol. That's attribution-based work, right? That's going after the, uh, the source of the problem. Uh, our end game is to make it more expensive for cyber criminals to operate. And so we're doing that through working with Interpol uh, and law enforcement as an example. We're also working with National Computer Emergency Response. So ripping malicious infrastructure offline. Um, that's all about partnership, right? So that's what I mean, strength in numbers, uh, collaboration, it's, it's a very powerful thing. Something close to my heart that I've been building up over, over 10 years. And you know, we're seeing a lot of success and impact from it, I think. But some of the, uh, if, if you go back and look at some of the old threats, that were you know, very invasive, very problematic, moved relatively fast, but they were still somewhat slow. Now we're talking about a new class of threat that happens like that. Yep. Uh, it suggests that the arrangement of assets that a company like Ford and Net requires to respond and provide value to customers has to change. Yes. So talk a little bit about how, not just the investment in product, but also the investment in FortiGuard Labs yeah. is evolving you talked about partnerships, for example, to ensure that you have the right set of resources able to be engaged in the right time and applied to the right place with the right automation. Talk a little bit about that. Sure, sure. So, um, because of the criticality of this nature, we, we, we have to be on point every day. As you said, you mentioned healthcare, operational technology is a big thing as well. Um, you know, Phil was talking about sci-fi as well, right? The cyber physical convergence. So we, we have to be on our game and on point. And how do we do that? A couple of things. One, we need people still. We, we, we can't, uh, you know, Ken was talking about his, his speech in, in Davos at the World Economic Forum, of three to four million people, shortage in cybersecurity of professionals. There's never going to be enough people. Uh, so what we've done strategically is actually repositioned our experts at FortiGuard Labs. Uh, we have over 235 people in FortiGuard Labs, so as a network security vendor, it's the largest security operation uh, center in the world. Um, but 235 people alone aren't going to be able to battle 100 billion threat events that we process a day at FortiGuard Labs. So, so what we've done, of course, is take up over the last five years machine learning, artificial intelligence. We have real practical applications of AI and machine learning. Uh, we use a supervised learning set, so we actually have uh, our machines learning about threats, and we have our human experts, instead of tackling the threats one-on-one, -on -one, themselves on the front lines, they let the, ma the machine learning models do that, and they're training the machine learning. Just, it's, a, it's like a parent and child relationship. Uh, it takes time to learn. Uh, as machines learn over time, they start to become more and more accurate. Um, the only way they become more accurate is by our uh, human experts literally being embedded with these machines and training them. Yeah, right? part participating in training, but also there's this augmentation side, right? Yeah. Where increasingly the machines are providing or are recognizing something and then providing a range of options mm. so that the security professional in particular doesn't have to go through the process of 
you know, discovery and forensics to figure out everything. Absolutely. The machines yeah. presenting that, yeah. but also presenting potential remedi remediation options. Yeah. Are you starting to see that become a, a regular feature? Absolutely. And especially we, in concert with your 235 experts. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We, uh, and that's, that's a necessity. So in my world, that, that's what I refer to as actionable intelligence, right? There's a lot of data out there. There's a lot of intelligence. Uh, the world's becoming data-centric right now, but sometimes we can have too much data as, as humans, as, as analysts, as administrators. So absolutely, remediation suggestions and, and actually enforcement of that is the next step as well. We've already added some features in, in 40 OS 6.2 and in our fabric to be able to deal with this. So we're, I think we're innovating and pioneering in this space there. Um, it's, it's a, a matter of trust, right? If you have the machines uh, or let's, uh, you know, um, security technology that's making decisions on its own, you really have to trust that. Um, and trust doesn't happen overnight. Um, that's why for us, we have been investing in this for uh, over six years now for our machine learning models to become very accurate. Um, it, it's been a, a good success story for us, I think. Um, the other thing, uh, going back to your original question, um, you know, how do we stack up against this? Of course, that whole edge computing use case, right? Um, so we're starting to take that machine learning down, uh, from the cloud environment also into local environments, right? Because a lot of that data is unique, it's local in, in environments. It, it stays to, there. It stays there and it, has, and it has to be processed as such too. So that's another shift in technology. As we move towards edge computing, machine learning and artificial intelligence is absolutely part of that story too. You mentioned strength in numbers when we were talking about you know, the, the opportunity for Fortinet to help customers really be successful here. I wanted to, to go back to FortiGuard Labs for a second sure. because it's a very large number. Yes. 100 billion yeah. security events, FortiGuard Labs ingests and analyzes daily. Daily, yes. Talk about that as a differentiator. Okay, yeah, that, that's a huge, huge differentiator, right? So again, if I look back to when I started in 2004, that number would have been, um, about 500,000 events a day compared to 100 billion today. In fact, even just a year ago, we were sitting about 75 to 80 billion. So that number has increased almost 20 billion in, uh, let's say 20%, right, <laughs> in, uh, in just a year. So that's, that's going to continue to happen. But it's an absolutely huge number, and it's a huge number because we have very big visibility, right? We have over 400,000 customers worldwide. We have built a, a core intelligence network uh, for almost 20 years now since Fortinet uh, was founded. Um, you know, we, we work together with, uh, with customers. So if customers wish to share data about attacks that are happening, because attackers are always coming knocking on doors, uh, we can digest that, we can learn about the attacks, we know, you know what weapons that these cyber criminals are trying to use, where the cyber criminals are, we learn more about the cyber criminals. So we're doing a lot of big data processing. Um, I have a data science team that's doing this, in fact, and, and what we do is process this data, we understand the threat, and then we take a multi-pronged approach. So we're, we're uh, consuming that data from automation, we're pushing that out first and foremost to, to our customers, so that's that automated use case of pushing protection from new threats that we're learning about. Uh, we're contextualizing the threat, so we're creating playbooks. So that, a playbook is much like football, right? You have to know your, uh, um, your, your, your offense, right? and you have to know how to best uh, uh, understand their tactics. And so we're doing that, right? We're, we're mapping these playbooks, understanding tactics, understanding where these guys are, how they operate. We take that to law enforcement, as I was saying earlier as an example. Uh, we take that to the Cyber Threat Alliance, uh, to, to our other partners. Um, and the more that we learn about this attack surface, the more that we can do in terms of protection as well. Uh, but it's, it, it's a huge number. We've had a scale in our data center massively. Uh, to, to be able to support this over the years, but we are uh, poised uh, for scalability uh, for the future to be able to consume this uh, on our end too. So it's, it's, um, that's why I said um, you know, at the start, it's never a boring day <laughs> in my office. It, how can it be? But it sounds like you know, really the potential there to enable customers in any industry to convert, transform, let's use for transform, since we talk about digital transformation, transform from being reactive yep. to being proactive to eventually predictive. Yep, and cost effective too, right? This is another thing with that cybersecurity skills gap. Um, you know, this, the solution shouldn't be for any given customer to try to have 230 people in their security center, right? Um, this is that working relationship where we can do a lot of that proactive automation for them, you know, via the fabric, via the, all the stuff that we're doing um, through our investment and efforts on the back end. I think it's really important too. And um, 
yeah, at the end of the day, the other thing that we're doing with that data is generating human readable reports. So we're actually helping our customers at a high level understand the threat, right? So that they can actually uh, create policies on their end to be able to respond to this, right? Harden their own security, uh, deal with things like insider threats for their uh, you know, uh, networks. These are all suggestions that we give them based off of our experience. You know, we issue our quarterly threat landscape report as an example. Come in the right? cube, some of your people come in the cube yeah, and talk about yeah, it. Yeah, absolutely. So that's one product of that 100 billion events that we're processing every day. But like I said, it's a multi-pronged approach. We're doing a lot with that data, which, which is a great story, I think. Yeah. It is, I wish we had more time, Derek. Thank you so much for coming by and never a dull moment, <laughs> never a dull interview when you're here. We appreciate your time. I can't wait to see what that 100 billion number is next year at Fortinet 2020. It will be more, I can guarantee you that. <laughs> I think, I, I, it sounds like it. Well, Derek, thank you so much thank for joining so much. Peter okay. and me. We appreciate it. For Peter Burris, I'm Lisa Martin. You're watching theCUBE.